Today, I'm at the hidden paradise that is the private garage of Lowballer GTR, a secret car collection here in Arizona that today we're going to be exploring. Hi guys, I'm Shmi, hello, and welcome back to the channel where Jordan has very kindly invited me to bring you along for a tour of this eclectic mix of cars. We're talking everything from JDM legends, the R33, 34, and 35. We have some absolute powerhouses of American muscle with the Dodge Demon and the Viper ACR. European performance with the E39 M5, CLK Black Series, an E63 wagon, plus Italian Exotica like the Aventador SVJ and a very interesting 355 Challenge, plus plenty of Porsches, including some fairly heavily modified cars also. Not only that, the cars, the way they're presented downstairs, the upstairs lounge areas as well. Let's go and take a look around. You have no doubt noticed there's a bit of a thing theme with the cars here. A very dark, all blacked out theme. Well, Jordan's going to be talking us through the cars in the collection, some amazing stories. I just had a little bit of an insight, but I love getting this sense of what makes somebody tick. Why did they choose the cars that they chose? How did they build this kind of garage? There are even cars here that I don't even know what they are exactly. The two up there. We will get to all of this, but I love already the variety. That's a big part of it. So let's go find Jordan, go take a proper look around the full Lowballer GTR collection. How you doing? Good, bro. How you doing, man? Well, it's great. Thank you very much for having me down. This place is amazing. Thank you, bro. I appreciate it, dude. No, this is absolutely incredible. Honestly, there's, there's a bit of a theme going on. There is, it's all black. It's a slimming <laughs> color. <laughs> there are some bright colors down there, which we'll get to in a moment. Yeah, dude. But you have everything. I mean. That is particularly special. Very special. But I think we're gonna to have to come back to that in a moment. Sure, yeah, no problem, man. Sh should we start right here? Yeah, talk we'll start to, right here. Talk to us about this 355. So this is a 355. Um, it's actually a standard 355. It's not a, uh, it looks like a challenge car, but it's all OEM challenge parts. This car was delivered new to Japan. Um, it remained with the single J Japanese owner for quite a bit of time. He did a full build on it. It has a Toyota stroker motor. Okay. Yeah, Toyota typically is uh, Honda parts. Yeah. So the whole Toyota catalog is all Honda, and there's this one little section of Ferrari. So <laughs> it's a it's, uh, stroker motor, it's a Toyota stroker, and the guy that b uh, owned this car, he really wanted it to be reliable like a Porsche. He wrote a letter to the new owner who bought yeah. it. So I got to translate the letter. It's pretty endearing. He's like, I love this car but being kind of like a mid nineties Ferrari, it had trouble pacing on the, you know, the track for a long yeah. time. So he did uh, upgraded oil coolers, larger radiators. He really wanted to make it like a bulletproof 355. And that was kind of the point of this car. That's cool. So yeah. all OEM upgrade parts, the wing, yep. suspension and, wheels. Yeah, well, OEM, uh, OEM challenge parts, like OEM challenge seats. Yeah. Um, but then you get to like JRZ coilovers, work emotion wheels. And what's even kind of funnier is that they're like really obsessed with USDM stuff. So like where we're obsessed with JDM, yeah. they're like we love the stop text and like that was all part of the letter. And I'm like, stop tech, you could have put endless on it or <laughs> one of these many cool Japanese brands, right? Um, but you know, he did a really nice bulletproof car and it, it, it chops like a big V8. Yeah. It's just like at idle, it's like bop, 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 bop. So it's, it's really, cool. really cool. I love this car. That's amazing. Yeah, well, every, everyone loves kind of what they can't have, right? Like, yeah, 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 ex <laughs> exactly. It's also, like something that's different. I mean, still in the Italian corner though. Yeah. SV, SVJ. SVJ. I kind of everyone knows about these cars. I love this because I've always loved Aventadors. Yeah. Um, they are much more than the legacy of revving in the parking lot, you know. Um, <laughs> and I think that this is going to be the last, this is the last extreme, naturally aspirated Lamborghini V12 that will be made. Yeah, non hybrid, of course. Yeah, non hybrid. Would you so, be interested in a Revuelto or is it different? I would be. I would be. I'm not, I'm not super anti like hybrid technology. I think yeah. it's got a place to live, but. I mean, come on, man. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's just like so perfect, you know? And this is, I've, I have to ask one question. Sure. <laughs> that. <laughs> okay, so clearly I have a Ferrari. Yeah. I do like Ferrari, but I have a friend that's a big Ferrari collector. And I was like, just joking around. I'm like, oh, this plate's available. I could look it up on the Arizona yeah. DMV. And he was like, that'd be very childish. And I was like, say less. <laughs> so yes, I ordered done. it. Done, <laughs> done. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It, it works when you have both a Lambo and a Ferrari. Yeah, it's so I think of... I, I passed the test of like not being a dick, you know? You're, you're neutral on that <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to me about this because of the uh, cars here, there are very few that aren't black. I know. But this is one of them. This is, and this is like my car that's not black. So uh, the other cars, uh, we'll get to those, but I love this car. It's Avatar and Green Metallic. They only made four 993 slick tops in this. This is actually a Tribute 911 GT. Uh, originally, 
in Japan, Porsche Mizwa, Technical Mate in Japan did yeah. this. This is their wide body kit that they sold to Porsche Motorsport. So it's as close to OEM Porsche as you'll get. Um, after it left Japan, it went to your neck of the woods. It went to the UK with a really big air-cooled collector. He did the 993 twin turbo motor swap. Okay. And that's really what made it a proper 911 GT tribute. Yeah. Um, I think it was Dave the Trimmer did the entire interior. So the factory, the Recaros <clears throat> that are typically like a, a cloth, he did in genuine leather, yeah. matched the red piping to the belts and kind of tied the whole car together. And this is just like one of my favorite cars. It's like... Um, the small old era of Porsches, yeah. like a go-kart, just so cool. Just all about driving. You were just teaching me because I didn't actually know the explanation of a slick top. Yeah, the slick top. So 993s were standard sunroof. So typically you pay for a sunroof, but in yeah. this rare instance, it costs you money to delete the sunroof. It's funny, isn't it? When you think about 911, purest driver's cars, yes. often you don't want the weight up top. No, exactly, right? An upgrade to remove the sunroof. Yeah, and I, maybe I think the 90s, that was just like an era thing, yeah. like sunroof, like a beautiful day. New, new concept, new technology. Yeah, yeah. That's a cool thing. I love this car, super and cool. You found it, it was in this color. Would you ever be tempted to paint it? I, like, I would be. I, had, I think we talked about I had a Ferrari that was red that got delivered, but it was so nice. And when this car got imported, my buddy that works at Cars LA that does all the importing, yeah. he like, was like, mate, car's so sick yeah so like we walked up to it and i'm like dude it is so be it would just be really hard yeah to sand this paint off especially yeah. with how rare it is it looks really nice and the the setup with the wheel color and everything it's, it has a nice look yeah so you know this is like my colorful side so yeah. I, I i'm okay with this color yeah you the know? One. yeah, yeah. And i like that you kept the uh the british plate I on did. the front yeah i thought that was so cool and then uh <laughs> being educated on how like yeah. i thought this was just a nice detail and then you were telling me oh well this is actually how it has to be the uh, black dot on the yeah. end and then the white dot here. Well, it depends obviously on the lettering, but yeah. and where it's screwed. In a UK plate, you can you sticky tape or you can have it screwed in like this. Yeah, totally. And you always have to have the matching colors. Yeah, that blew my mind when you told me that. But I figured this is just a nice tribute to where the car came from and I enjoy the story on the cars. Love so it. I just want to keep it there. It's all about a story with it cars. Is, I mean, there's so much of that here. Yeah. And, and I, I'm a big, big believer in it. I think if you can create a connection with your cars, Yes. It, it, it means more to you. Than just like going and being like, ah, I bought it because it was this. Yeah, and exactly. it's like so, so boring, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So, 991.1 GT3? 991.1 GT3 with the new G motor. So the problematic uh, original 3.8 has been replaced yep. on this car. It's still a 3.8. Did every single one have the motors replaced? Yes. It was so, that screw that caused a, caused a fire kind of thing. Yeah, well, so it was two things. Um, the rod bearings, uh, the, I'm sorry, the rod bearing bolt, the bolts yep. on the crank were bad. Yeah. So all of them got recalled because of that. But then there's that finger follower issue in the cylinder head. And that's what happens. It grinds down. You end up getting a cylinder misfire code and they need to replace the engine. It's only if you kind of track the car or drive them hard. Yeah. But I like the 3.8 over the 4.0. It kind of reminds me of the pre-LP Gallardos, how they have that yeah. real high revving sound yep. versus the LPs are a little bit deeper tone. Yeah. So I'm kind of a sucker for the 3.8. Um, I got this car, it had the 10 year extended. My wife took it to the track. And she calls me and she's like, I think I blew the car up within the oh, warranty. No. Yeah. We had two months left. So I think we were the only people to be really excited that we blew a car up because it was under warranty <laughs> still. still. Warranty. <laughs> yeah. what, what have you done with it? So this car is actually pretty simple. A slight drop, the BBS E88s, and then it has a full Acura exhaust system and Evo okay. system on it. So, so it'll sound nuts. Sounds fantastic. <laughs> sounds yeah. absolutely nuts. I love it. So we come past yeah. the, the colored cars here. Yes. <laughs> Let's color, talk about it. The colored cars. So these are my wife's. She is a beautifully colorful person and she loves color on cars. Yeah. So um, this is a BMW M3. And the interesting thing I learned about the BMW individual program, kind of just surfing the internet. And I'm like, they'll paint any BMW, any OEM manufacturer color. So it kind of blew my mind. So I, I'm like, hey, I want to get this twilight purple metallic. This is yeah. a Rolls Royce color. We saw it at an auto show and I loved it. I just thought it was a great purple. So I had bought a ton of cars from this BMW dealership locally. But we'd only bought two BMWs and about 28 Priuses for our business. Yeah. But legitimately, I would just give the used car guy like, hey, go find four Priuses for our company. He'd yeah. buy them. So BMW North America declined this order several times. Yeah. And what ended up happening was after like two or three times of declining it, the GM of that store called BMW North America and said, listen, this guy is like a VIP customer. He's bought 30 cars from us. Yeah. And they approved the order, but you know, 28 of the 30 were Prius. <laughs> so yeah. two no, BMWs and Prius. It's cool because there aren't exactly many around, I guess. It no, must be super rare. No, this is like, I, I'm almost positive at this point, this is a one of one with a six speed competition package. Yes. So yeah, my wife really wanted a six speed uh -huh, um, in this car. Cool. 
So it is a six-speed manual. You got the comp package with the carbon bits, et cetera. Yeah. Um, as soon as it got here, we did the BBSs before they got incredibly trendy. And we did a BMW, the Haas coilover kit, because I wanted to keep the warranty at yeah. the time. So nice little uh, slide-on coilover kit. I dropped it a little bit, but otherwise this car is pretty stock. It looks nice. You've got quite a few sets of BBS wheels around here. Yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> sponsor me, guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. They should Take be getting it. involved. Yeah, yeah exactly. We're yeah. shouting them out nicely here. Yeah. And then the... Uh, the big uh, one from the 911 lineup, the GT2 RS. Yeah, so my wife has always loved Miami blue. It's yeah. been like her Porsche color. And when we were looking, she wanted a GT3, like a .1 or a .2, 991. Yeah. And I was like, hey, the GT3s had just started to really rise, but the twos were still lagging in price. Yeah. So long and short, I'm like, hey, you know, two RSs are kind of a good price compared to GT3, uh, GT3s. And, uh, you know, we got the car. I've always loved them. We had never drove one. So it got yeah. off the truck, we got a good deal on the car, it had 400 miles on it. And like, I took it for a quick spin and I just like came back, I'm like, you need to be seriously careful. Cause yes. this is like violent, ballistic. violently fast. Have but, you tracked it? So I tracked it once and my wife has gotten really big into tracking. Her car's yeah. not here, her track car. But my wife about a month ago took this on the track yeah. and she crushed it. I was yeah. really blown away and like 2% scared just cause it's such a violent car. Yep. But man, she, she absolutely crushed it. She did a great job. and. It is just a, a stellar car. It is the fastest stock car I've ever driven. Yeah, it's, I, I've had a few track outings in two RSs, and it's the stopping power, the, the, <sighs> the aero grip, mechanical grip, just everything about it is yeah. just so good. The brakes are so good, and then kudos to Porsche. You know, when you let off the power, it, it maintains boost. It closes yeah. the variable turbo, so you never get, like, turbo lag when you get back on power. And the fact that it's as much power as it is with the boost strategy they built in, is it sketchy? Yes, but it's not undrivable, you know? <laughs> no, not undrivable at all. Yeah. It's great. So I've always loved it for that reason. So that is a very nice pair of cars your wife is driving. Yeah, she's doing really good. I like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, but we continue, <laughs> yeah. We continue the German theme. We've just had a BMW and a Porsche, and now we have some Mercedes. Yeah, so this is a CLK 63 Black Series. This is just, this, you know, when I started my business, I would have loved to have owned one of these, but they were just when I started my company, I, there was no chance. And I just think it's uh, one of the really great, it's wide body, the yeah. GT, you know, the GT3 diff, the race car diff with yeah. the cooler. And it's much more than just like the sticker that are on like up trimmed cars today. Yeah. I feel like Mercedes really did a good job. Olin's coilovers from the factory. And I'm almost positive this is the first car that was delivered in uh, North America with a rear seat delete. So okay. like kind of being an extreme car. Yeah. I always thought that was like so crazy going to the Mercedes store and you're like, it has no back seat. It was so track focused, <laughs> right? Um, I it's, just think it's, it's such funny because nowadays that, that's even an option on like a Mustang or exactly a, or whatever. Yeah, the, or the Dodge Demon, like a rear seat yeah. delete. So you look at like something like this and just such a refined brand to say, we're not going to put a back seat in it. It's so crazy. And I just love this car. Super, super gnarly. Really cool. Yeah. I mean, you don't need to upsell black series cars to me at all. <laughs> yeah. I'm a very big fan. <laughs> yeah. the, the CLK is not one I've, I've owned yet, but would love to, to try some more of at some point in the future. Brutal car. Yeah, it's, it was really, I think, the one that made the, the Black Series badge mean something. Yeah. You know, the, the, the SLK was obviously not available here in North America at all, no. so they weren't very popular. Um, I've got a complete brain block. The CLK came next, didn't it, before C the SL? I think, uh, yeah, so CLK came next, and this was the first Black Series we received in this country. Yeah. So even as the American consumer, we always had AMGs, yeah. but you're like, whoa, Black Series. And it's just the, cool. you know, the cool logo underneath the AMG, <laughs> and you're like, this feels so special. They did it. They did it right. Yeah. They also have a habit at AMG of doing these right. Yeah, wagons, this, very fast wagons. The wagon, you know, it never caught on in the States. I'm a big wagon guy. I think they're so practical. We put our dogs in this. Um, we've done a couple road rallies in this. It is incredibly comfortable. We've taken it to the track. We went to Apex, yeah. you know. Yeah, <laughs> I chased it. I did, I, ch I chased my friend around in his 3RS until the brakes started to get a little soft. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna Yeah, say. I was driving a little hard on it. Um, but man, it's just such a great car. It's super comfortable. Mercedes is one of the best interiors, I think, mm -hmm. in automotive space right now. Um, it's a mix of like great tech, great sound, yes. great comfort, just yep. everything you want, practicality, the whole lot. Yep, did a little exhaust on this. It's got an AWE exhaust, so it's got a little growl. Still stock computer-wise, but okay. just a really cool little sleeper. No one ever yeah. expects it. And yeah, we debadged sure. it. Yeah, that's yeah. even better. That's yeah. like the ultimate, isn't it? Like yeah. to have a massively powerful debadge wagon. Yes. No I one mean, thinks you're going to be. No one sees it coming. And when they launch with the air, like, I mean, they just look like they're digging like a yep. drag car. It's just so cool. It just purchased. We, we almost skipped over the bike, just tucked back. <clears throat> yeah, this was my father-in-law's. He was a big Harley guy. Okay. And um, he had passed away a few years ago, but I... Got the bike fully, you know, brought back up to great standards. Got 22,000 miles. 
he was just the ultimate man's man. He rode at Sturges yeah. every year, camped on the side of the road. And, um, you know, I just wanted to have it here. It's so that's special cool. to me. Yeah, yeah definitely. That's yeah. super cool. So it's just a, it's a really cool piece. It always reminds me of him. And uh, like I said, man, he was just like the toughest dude you ever met. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, camping <laughs> on the side of the road, dude, riding to Sturges. Yeah, he's just an awesome guy. Long hair. He was just, he was just so cool, man. Perfect. Love it. BMW. Yeah, E39. So E39 M5. This is a Dynan Stage 3 car. I okay. was, uh, yeah, it was a stage big. Stage 3. Yeah, the Stage 3. <laughs> so I was just, I loved the, uh, the Madonna Guy Ritchie video, the driver. Yeah. You know, how cool was that? The BMW did this amazing advert with like the cars jumping and it's drifting and it's, that's really common today, but that was like <laughs> really kind of new at the time. Yeah, yeah. And like, I think 02 or 03 when it came out and I just loved the car. So I bought this off the original owner, sent it to a local shop. We did all of the dining bits on it. I completely blew my budget on the, the <laughs> restoration of it. It's all new everything now, but it's as close to a new E39 M5 that you can find. It looks amazing. I mean, it's another example of sleeper, right? Because nobody's Total. gonna look at that. And, Ever. Do, do you know what power it's running? Um, it's about 450 horse of all the dining <laughs> bits now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. And then, then up above, a Honda. A Honda. So I think uh, the stateside viewers might understand, like a lot of these cars got stolen. This is a 99 Civic Si. It's pretty stock. I have all the stock parts, stock suspension, stock wheels. But this car is only 13,000 original miles on it. Okay, so basically new. Really clean, and again, so many of them were stolen or highly modified. Like when I was a kid, we modified these things. So to find them in this kind of pristine condition is a little bit rare. I don't drive this car a lot because of the fear of it getting stolen. I have to park <laughs> do they it with it. still get stolen? They still do, man. It's still, oh, no. a, it's still a thing. So I still have to park it within eyesight, so I'm not nervous. But this is probably, maybe, this is probably one of the least driven cars that's here. Or was that just another one of those that you wanted to have a clean yeah. example? And yeah, because you know, twenty twenty two thousand dollars, I think, back in ninety nine two thousand. So yeah. I mean, you know, today then like conversion money would it'd be like two hundred twenty thousand dollars. It's so yeah. unobtainable, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. So just to be able to get one and see it so clean, I know it's up there, but the interior is immaculate. It still smells like a new Honda inside. The guy took great care of it, and then he just put it away for about fifteen years until okay. I found it. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it fits right in with the collection. Yep. We're gonna talk about the R34, I think. R34s get so much love these days. They do. Isn't it amazing? How, how long have you owned this one? So I've actually, I've had this car about five years now. Okay. And um, I did a, a lot of restoration work. It's a very low kilometer car, but it just needed some little touch-ups here and there. Um, like all new old stock trim on the exterior. The car only has about 40,000 kilometers. This car is unique because in America, we can't have a car unless it's 25 years or older. Yep. So there was a company called Motor X. And they're, yeah. yeah, so I think people know the story. It defunct, but this was one of the original. There's 17 34s that are now accounted for that were Motor X cars. Yeah. So this is one of the 17. It's just been such an awesome car, but it is no doubt of anything in here. Either everyone knows what it is or no one does. And you'll have like an elderly person be like, it's like a post office truck and you're on the wrong side. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah that's kind of like what Something it is. Like that. Yeah, exactly. So how do you find it driving a right-hand drive car then? You know what's weird? The muscle memory, you would think the shifting would be weird, but the only thing that's really rough in America is turning left at an intersection yep. because you can't see around the car. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are honking at me because I'm like, I'm waiting for the green arrow. I'm not yeah. going to get drilled because I can't see around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. drive throughs are obviously a little bit of a problem. So I mean, how often are you taking your R34 through a drive -thru? Not a lot. <laughs> yeah, not a lot. <laughs> not, not on a daily basis. <laughs> not on a daily. It looks clean. What is this exactly? This is a so this is an 01 V-Spec 2. Ironically, this car has been here in America longer than it was in Japan. It came here in 05. Oh, so wow. it's resided in America longer than it's Japanese yeah, yeah, ownership. Um, it's and nearly you know, 20 years here in America. About 20 years. So this will be legal in uh, 2026, but kind of like the Honda, man, a, a lot of these cars were, no one knew how special they were. I have a friend in Australia that has one. And he said in 2007, he paid about 35,000 USD for his. Yeah. And now he's talking about selling it because he just can't afford to fix parts on it because yeah. they're so hard to find. Isn't it crazy? It must be one of the biggest examples of cars that appreciated over the last 10 years. Oh man. So. I that wondering. curve is insane. Yeah, I mean, Z-Tunes are going for, you know, over $2 million now. <laughs> Granted, there's not that many, but it's crazy to think that this in different trim is a $2 million car. Yeah, yeah, absolutely wild. I actually drove one for the first time only about a year What'd ago. What'd you think? Loved it, right? to be honest. Actually, I've now driven a couple of them in quick succession. Um, friend 458 Destroyer. Yeah, has, has yeah he's a, a great has guy. A garage off yeah, him. yeah, he's yeah. awesome, dude. Yeah, yeah. really cool. And yeah. A lot of fun out there. And it's like, it's funny because there's a fanboy following, but yes. if you really, it is a great driver's car. And especially, you know, we can get to the 996, but those cars were competing. That's what this car was sent to kill, was the yeah, 911 yeah. Turbo. And hands down, 
I'm a Porsche, I love Porsche, but there is no doubt in my mind, this is a better driver's car. They were made fun of for the MFD display. Other manufacturers called it gimmicky, and now <laughs> everyone has it. Yep. The rear steer, although a little bit clumsy and compared to modern ones, you can really feel it working, bringing the back of the car around so you don't get that all-wheel drive understeer. Yep. I mean, it's just a great driver's car, so anyone, you know, it's, it's outside of just the hype of being Gran Turismo, it's a really cool car to drive. Yeah, for sure. You should experience it. And obviously, yeah. R35s, the Godzillas. The Godzilla. And a T-Spec. T-Spec. So this is a midnight purple car. This is one of, I believe, 22 or 33 that was delivered to the United States. This is the only car I've ever owned that I've kept delivery mileage. And I really don't know if I'll do it again because it's slight torture never being able to drive it. Yep. And now that I've had it for two years, I'm like, well, now I can't drive it because it's been two years. Yeah. <laughs> um, Nissan ended up continuing it for one extra year. So... I don't know. My wife's always like, let's just take it out one weekend and rip the Band-Aid off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I don't know how I feel about it. once but... you've done it the first time, yeah. then you can go out and drive it. It's over. You know, it's done. And I would love to drive it. This is my third one. And I think if you own something three times, you shouldn't sell it because obviously you love you it. You clearly have a thing for it. Exactly. And I think when you, when you throw in the, the whole collection, yeah. you've got to have a 30, <laughs> exactly. 35. Exactly. I used to have them in unison, but now it's up there because yeah. I'd get tempted to drive it. <laughs> that's, that's also true. As soon as you stick a car on a lift up top, it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. And yeah. I don't really want to move everything. So yeah, that's like, I think that's really why it still has delivery mileage as I put it up there. Or is it just so that you can see it from your desk up top? 50-50. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get to the two cars I do know, the two that I don't, Yes. I've got a lot to learn here. Yeah, so this is a 1956. This is a two-door. It's not a Bel Air. It's a post car, so it's a 210. So the B-pillar post right yeah. there is what makes it a 210 and not a Bel Air. Okay. So this car is really special to me because when I was a kid growing up, I grew up next to a, a retired FDNY firefighter. His name was Ray. And I'd ride my bike home from school, and he was always restoring his 1956. Okay. So he had all black cars. Yeah. So I actually think that's probably, I don't think. It is really where that is. It's a big part of it. <laughs> yes. And um, I was, he was an idol of mine. He's the greatest human being I've ever met. And when I bought this car, I was so excited to show him it was white. I told him I was going to repaint it. And he said, I want to show you something. So he takes me in his garage. He goes, I'm resto modding my car. I'm putting an LS in it. But the big block that is in the 56, I'll sell it to you and no one else. So the, the childhood dream car, the 56 that he had, the engine is in that car. That's cool. So it's just like so special to me. Yeah. And it's a, it's a 427 big block with a Doug Nash five speed and a, a nine inch rear end. It's a great Saturday night bruiser. It's about yeah. 600 horsepower. <laughs> it is super duper gnarly with the five speed. It's just a very visceral experience. Yeah, yeah. I can I can imagine just yeah. going for a cruise around in that. No power steering, no power brakes. So yeah. yeah, I mean, you're like two feet on the brake pedal. So it's like, forget the SVJs. That's cool. That is cool. For and cruising. Yeah, and it's a, it's a winter car only. It gets too hot here in the summer. But yeah. as far as like historical significance, the 1956 Chevy to me is why everything is black. And then just having the engine from my childhood dream car yeah. in that car, is, it's just so important to me. That's really cool. Now, Thanks, the car next to it, yeah. I've spotted that it says ACR on the side. That's right. I know of ACRs for this, but that's got to be in the history there. It is. So it's going to break the Viper ACR guy's hearts. But the reason we have Viper ACRs is because of the Dodge Neon. The Dodge Neon was actually the first ACR, American Championship Racer. Yeah. It was a little race series that they did with them. This is an 05 SRT4 ACR with a dealer installed stage three package. So the dealer would install this aftermarket kit on it. It was under warranty. So this is kind of yeah. that cool era of cars where you know you had this really great parts catalog. You could do all these options. Yeah. Stage three was the top dog. This car's a little over 400 horsepower and in 05 it was hurting V8's feelings. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, budget car, $19,000 brand yeah. new. And uh, this was actually my first high performance car was yeah. the Dodge Neon SRT4. That, that exact one. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. Yeah, I love this car. It's super cool. A lot of history in them. Yeah, you I was know? gonna say, I'm, I'm loving something. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, and the ACR has BBSs on it. So yeah, of course. <laughs> another, another plug for BBS. Uh, <laughs> Takiko five-way adjustable struts, ACR seats, um, and a couple of other little small tidbits. But overall, a great car, 2.4 liter, four cylinder, and it's just a cast iron block. Even in the modified world, outside of the Mopar stuff, they made about 600 wheel, 700 wheel, reliably on a stock bottom end. Okay. And it was just the performance, um, in my opinion, the ultimate sport compact in America at the time. Yeah, for sure. Yep. 
Well, more recently, they've added a few more cylinders. They have. <laughs> to, yeah. to the Viper ACR. The, uh, the, the 10 cylinder Viper ACR. This is an ACR Extreme. Yeah. So, with the Extreme, you get the extra louvered fenders, all the canards up front, yeah. all the extra aero. Um, this car produces uh, almost 1,800 foot pounds or 1,800 pounds of downforce at 150 miles an hour. It's mad, isn't it? It's insane. I, I, I feel like. The Viper, even ACR, non-extreme, never quite got the attention it probably deserved because this thing is a 8.4 litre V10, manual gearbox, massive wing and aero. Yep. Like clearly incredibly capable. People were taking them to tracks and, and setting insane lap times. There, uh, I think this is kind of like Dodge's version of the 0506 Ford GT. They weren't yeah. really ultra appreciated when they were out, but now the popularity is skyrocketed. Yeah. But on the track, I don't care what anyone says. It is the it is the ultimate fixed arrow, no active arrow fanciness, analog monster you can drive. And yeah. when I took this to Apex, our local track, um, there's a turn. It's called Turn 12. And it's a big long sweeper, and this car will do about 125 around there. <laughs> and like, I mean, the most the 99, the dot one GT3 can do is about 95, and that feels kind of sketchy. Yeah. So 95, 100. Yeah. Um, but this car is just such an animal, and I love everything about it. I'm got to. They've tripled in value, so I'm a little bit more nervous now tracking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it looks seriously mean. Obviously, Viper is discontinued. Yeah. Um, this was the ultimate final end of a serious era. Like it a was. Big part of muscle supercar, I want to call it. It was. And the Connor plan is where these cars were built. It, they were all hand built by the Connor, the Connor team, which was yeah. like the pinnacle of working for Dodge. Yeah. You, went to the, the Viper factory. So my wife and I actually went to Detroit. We saw the Connor plan, it's empty now. The plans are to maybe make it a, a museum from okay. what I've heard, but it's just so sad to like this legacy of the Dodge Viper. Yeah. That's where it was produced for all that time. And I think it was just really ahead of its time. You know, this was a crate. They had a crazy customization program. You could have painted a Viper over 6,000 colors. Yeah. And I just think they were way ahead of their time because now we're, we're in this PTS craze, the right? PTS madness, but PTS it's a couple hundred or maybe a thousand colors or something. Yeah. So, so I they, mean, you could choose from anything. It's literally that you could choose like from, from a color. It was a big circle yeah. and you could drag the mouse. And then once you decided on the color, inspect it, they sent you a photo every step along the way to really? your email. Yeah, it was so customized and so cool, but it just didn't get the love it deserved. The Viper community is super fanatic, yeah. but the general population didn't really understand these cars. And once the ACRE came out and it broke 13 track records with an engineer driving it, not even like a professional yeah. driver, <laughs> I think that's when people started to take notice of it. Yeah, take some big notice. But clearly Dodge do a great thing with the customer experience. Yeah. Because what we're gonna see in a moment behind the Demon yeah. is probably the best example of yes, that. Yes, dude, yeah. So, I mean, talking Demon, you've had that from new, yeah, the first, this is actually the first new car that I was ever had the pleasure of sitting down and specking out and ordering. Okay. So it was a really cool experience in 2017. Um, the car arrived, I was just blown away by it. I mean, it's rowdy, it's yeah. 800 plus horsepower and you know, the, the rear end's different, but it's kind of like a Dodge Challenger unibody. And it's on a real soft suspension that has a lot of weight transfer. Yeah. So I mean, when you push the you know, pedal down, this car just, it shakes and moves and you're, you're kind of like washing dishes to keep it straight, but that's kind of its charm, right? Um, I love it. This car is actually a little bit unique in the sense that we did a rally, my wife and I, we were supposed to take a Gallardo. It broke down right before. And uh, this car got delivered to New York City with 66 miles on it. Yeah. And we drove it coast to coast. So I think this might be the only coast to coast Dodge Demon ever. I guess most of them haven't really done a huge number of miles right <laughs> now. It any. became such collector things. And obviously the Demon 170s now are doing the same. I know the 170s super crazy. And yeah, but I, these have held crazy book. I mean, 129 to 140. I think I paid $82,000. I got this car for sticker. Yeah. So the dealer was really cool at the time. They honored the MSRP. I got this car for sticker and I, it's one of my favorite cars. It's you know, they're kind of slept on, but man, if you drive one, it's an experience. Just a beast. And Total again, beast. the end of an era, because the next generation is a little bit different. I know. This yeah. is like, these two cars really break my heart. I'm kind of a Dodge guy, but yeah. like, I understand the imminent future, but these are just like the last, just great. There's going to be awesome Chrysler just, product coming out, but this is the last of an era. Whatever you do, just keep them, please. They will. Yeah. yeah. These, these will never go anywhere. Yeah. And uh, talking of which, I think this is something that... It's been talked about a few times, but people don't know enough about this yes. and what all of this is. So this is the Demon Crate. 
Like the passenger seat was a $1 option, this was a $1 option, and some 400 demons didn't get ordered with the crate. Blows my mind. <laughs> yeah, because all you had to do was just tick the box. Check a box. People probably looked at it and was like, why would I want a crate for a dollar? I don't know why people didn't do it. It's like you're getting snap-on tools, all these things. So you get the PCM, the high-octane PCM, the high-octane mode um, switch panel, and a, a bunch of other things, the intake filter, like a bigger filter. You get the uh, impact gun. Yep. Yep. Demon branded. Oh, the, that's cool. the torque wrench is in here. Also, demon branded. If you open it, it says demon on it. Just like such custom yep. coolness. And this is where the skinnies go right here. Yep. And this is actually foam. So, what happens is you unscrew the trunk, yep. you pull the stereo out, the subwoofer, yep. and you drop this in. So, the whole point of it was it's a weekend drag racer. You can take all the supplies to the track. So, it comes in this crate, which looks amazing at home, yep. with this kit that you literally, you, you just take it apart and put it in the back of the car. Put it in the back of the car, you drive to the track with this, your skinnies are in the trunk, you take off the front wheels, you put the skinnies on, you flip it into high octane mode and go racing for the Saturday night and put everything back and drive it home. So I thought that was like so cool. And to your point, it's just like, I think this like really embodies how cool Dodge is. And I think yeah. people probably would roll their eyes, some people at it, but I just think it's such a cool custom piece. No, I think this this is up there with the type of experience you might get if you buy a Pagani or something, right? Yeah. But on a Demon. At a, a, Dodge. a Dodge Demon, right? Like that's, so I, that's what's so cool about yeah, it. Yeah, they're giving me. their customers, like, regardless of the brand, that like really personal fun experience yeah. to like just have this cool little kid or in Pagani's case, probably some emerald jewel key holder, you know? <laughs> but I think this is just like a entry level, amazing thing to do for the consumer. So what's the story here? You know what, I love animals and I just could ever kill anything. So this is a Viper V10 header set welded yeah. into a, uh, a buck. So I gotta hang it up somewhere in the shop, you it know? It looks cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's not, not a real animal, so I'm no, good no. with it. <laughs> that looks very cool. We're getting up towards this end of the room then. Yeah, yeah, so this is the, uh, the other side of the warehouse and, um, I've, I've loved these before they became like really, really popular. Yeah. So the funny story is, I think part of the RWB experience is getting to spec your car out, have Nakai San fly out, do all the work. Yeah. Um, I followed in front of your eyes. Yes, right. But I followed this dude on Instagram. It was one of the first profiles I ever followed was this guy. Yeah. And um, my buddy got to the car before me, but I have this car in an album saved because I always wanted to do an RWB, but it was this car. So. I think I missed that, you know, I would have loved to have the personalization experience, but like I literally would have showed Nikaisa on this and said, I want to do a 964. One, please? Yeah, yeah, this exact car. So when it came up for sale, done deal. Yeah. Um, I got this from my buddy Danny at RMC Miami. Uh, he got it first, he's an, he's, a, you know, he's an awesome guy, but he hunted it down, and, but this is like the dream RWB spec, proper color, uh, the Workmeister wheels, and just, they're just artistic, and I just think they're so beautiful. Yeah, it's the size of the arches that gets me every time. You look at this rear wheel arch, and it's just like, what's it's going massive. on It's massive. Yeah, and you look at it from the back, and it's just like, it can't go on a lift. It cannot yeah. go up there. Too it wide. honestly can't go in some driveways or garages or car parks because of how <laughs> wide it is. It won't even fit through the concrete. And the, the cool thing with these cars, though, is that in like a turbo trim, this is an NA car, they're, they're formidable track weapons. There's a really cool video of one going around Nürburgring, yeah. and he is chasing down a 991 GT3 RS. Okay. It's turboed, but these cars, they do the idlers, it's an endurance race, um, and they're really fast on the track. It's outside of just the stance kind of stuff that I think people think of RWBs. Yeah. So yeah, they're, they're amazing. They're artistic, they're super individualized, and totally potent track weapons in the right hands. It's a very different thing yeah. to the 996. Yeah, it's a very controversial turbo. Yeah. <laughs> the fried egg headlight. Yeah, yeah. Um, those, those have always been the biggest of big talking points, and they continue to be. And that's what's so fascinating. They still are. It's got a little bit more popular now, um, but this was the turbo that was in the showroom when I was in high school. So, you know, when you're drooling at the Porsche dealership, this was the car. Um, I bought this off a good friend of mine. He took amazing care of it. It's low mileage, 36,000 miles, some mild bolt ons. He did the wheels. Um, but I just, I love this car. I know it's, some Porsche guys will think it's sacrilegious, but I think it's different and it went outside of Porsche's norm. Um, and I just think that's what the best part of the 996 is, yeah. so. Well, they're coming up, aren't they? They're coming up in interest. They are, and, yeah. And, I got this car when it was still not the come up price. So now I'm like looking at values like, well, not too bad. Yeah, didn't do badly there. Yeah. <laughs> the Supra. 
This is, this is a Supra. This is actually a HKS USA. This is their demo Supra. So demo cars for Japanese companies are a you know, demonstration of their parts. Yeah. So it's all HKS bolt-ons, their HKS wide body kit, um, the GT wing, the uh, Advan GTs, their coilovers, intake kit, and a few other little bits and pieces. But the cool part about this car is I got to have a great relationship with HKS because of this car and they were moving their USA inventory around to make room for some new projects. And they were like, hey, you know, would you like to buy the Supra? And I'm on my way. Done. So so was this a SEMA car? Was this? They built it for SEMA. So some engineers, the Japanese guys had flown in, Japanese team, and they did the wide body. Mm -hmm. It was wrapped locally in the livery. It is black underneath, so yeah. we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they built it for, I want to say SEMA, gosh, I want to say 19 or 20. Um, car only has 6,000 miles on it. And the goal is actually to take this car to the track and enjoy it a little bit. Yeah. I've got to drive it on the street. Total open disclosure, I wasn't the biggest new Supra fan, but I think with the wide body, it just looks really, really cool. Yeah. It's really extreme. So I, I had one back when they came out and yeah. I also wasn't, I was on the fence about it yeah. for, through, through a lot of that period, but I've grown to them as time's gone by. And I think a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. It's kind of established itself because at the end of the day, okay, yes, it was developed heavily with BMW, et cetera, et cetera. But once you've got your head over that and you start appreciating it for how good it is actually as a car. It is. And like once you drive in it, you're like, man, the interior quality is phenomenal. It's yeah. pretty quiet inside. And I mean, the, the Supras like in the US time attack, I don't know how it is where you're at. I mean, they're holding like some very, very formidable times in time attack. So it's a wonderful platform. Um, and I just, it's really grown on me and I totally love it. Do you still have yours? No, I sold it a while back. I get it. Kept in touch with the owner though, which is cool. Really? Yeah. That's the best part of the story. I like to follow the onwards journeys of some of the former cars I've had. Yes. Same as like you, because sometimes they come back or there's a yes. story or a connection or something. I actually have a weird thing that typically I really won't sell a car to just a stranger. Yeah. So when I sold that Ferrari, that red Ferrari as a wide body car I had, I had a few YouTubers hit me up and a couple other people and I was just like, I just don't want to see anything bad happen to it. Yeah. So I was so lucky it went to a local collector who takes great care of it. But yeah. I get to see it and just yeah, you know, that's, talk that's to a, him. Yeah, that's so a big it's nice. part of the fun. It is, it is. We move on then to the last car, the last car in the building. Yeah, so this, uh, this is like the most special car in the building to me. This, uh, this car was delivered brand new to HKS, uh, HKS Japan in 1995. This car is codenamed T002, which stands for Test 002. Uh, T001 was a, a, a Mark IV Supra but this was the parts development car for all R33 parts. And this car has major historical significance because it was a Sakuba lap record holder. It went sub one minute, um, it's in the 56 second range, which is just you know, mind numbing to think about. Yeah. And the zero to 300 kilometer an hour, that was a big competition for all the Japanese tuners at the time in the mid nineties. It was a zero to 300 kilometers an hour in mid 17 seconds. Yeah. And to give some kind of depth as to how fast that is in today's cars, uh, McLaren Senna does it in mid 17s. It's so crazy. to think this car, this exact one, I should this stress. exact car this, this car, this car, this car was HKS's. A friend of mine called me and said, Hey, I watched this car in option videos. I drooled over this car. It was the top dog in Japan for any R33. And a buddy calls me and says, man, they're auctioning T002 BH auction is. And I'm like, no, they're not like <laughs> it's a very secretive company. There's no way they're going to get rid of the car. And sure enough, I friggin' look on the website, it is up for auction. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, the auction's tomorrow. I can get my affairs in order. So I Google Japan time. The auction is that day. And it's yeah. like nine o'clock here in the US. Yeah, yeah, time zone is a long way so, from here. Yeah, so yeah, probably ignorant American. I'm like, we're all in the same time in the world. But I call them, I can't, I'm sorry, I don't call them. I email them and I'm like, call me 911. Like I want to register yeah, yeah. to bid. So dude, nine o'clock, they call me WhatsApp. Lady is super kind. She says, hey, no problem, we'll get you registered. I'm like, listen, I can send you a screenshot of like my financials, but I cannot, you know, I can't fill out a formal thing. My bank is not open. She was like, that's fine. So I'm like, all right, well, probably don't ever do that with any other American, but they were super trusting. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was like highly concerned for your well-being. Yeah. But um, they, I proxy bid, I stayed up until two in the morning. A couple of unique things. A, they disclosed the reserve in Japanese auction right before the auction starts. She says, the reserve is this. And I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of a unique thing that never yeah, happens. I didn't know that. And then she said, you have three guys who are from Australia that are bidding against you. And the Aussies take GTRs super serious. Yeah. So I was definitely sweating, but I ended up winning the bid. The car was just like this, but it had a stock RB, same turbo kit, 
but it was rear wheel drive. It was just like, it was built for Tokyo Auto Salon in 2019. Yeah. So they pulled it out of the graveyard. It was actually sitting abandoned for several years, for about 15 years at the base of Mount Fuji with like a tattered car cover. Okay. They did the restoration for Tokyo Auto Salon. And like two days after auction, they contact me and they're like, hey, the CEO of BH and the CEO of HKS are close friends and they'd be really interested in bringing the car back to what they call the Sakuba spec. Are you interested? And I'm like, yes. Of course I am. Of course I am. Like, don't ask me twice. Yeah, this is the <laughs> craziest question ever. So I apologized to my wife. She's a saint of a woman. And uh, said, hey, the car's going to HKS. So <laughs> yeah. they did their new 2.8 liter stroker. This is serial number one. Yeah. They contacted me the next day via email. And over the course of 60 days, we probably exchanged 300 emails. I got daily updates. They did the entire restoration in 60 days, the yeah. powertrain. It's got some really unique parts that are not even available to the public. Stuff they didn't even tell me about. Like yeah. when we got here, the car got here, this is a limited edition coilover and it's serial number 00 of 00. So it's their pre-production yeah. units. And stuff that they, they're just like totally nonchalant about. Like it, it landed yeah, and I'm like, it. oh my God. So when the car got here, it was incredible. They did a, a video on it, lapping Sakuba. Max Arito drove it. I couldn't go because of COVID. It was during the COVID uh, time. Yeah. So I'm bummed I didn't get to go, but I'm grateful I have the video memory of it forever yeah. with Max Arito driving it. Um, and I've just, this car is just so freaking important to me and special to me. And it's just bonkers. <laughs> the quality is amazing. Yeah. It was actually a full dashboard when it set all these world records, but it had degraded from being outside for so long. Yeah. So they made it really track focused, moved back the seating position, the pedal box and the steering wheel for more of a weight balance and a good bias. Um, all the guys at HKS signed the trunk that did the build on it. And I just took this car to SEMA HKS invited me, which was probably one of the highlights of my automotive life. And um, they didn't even know a lot of the Jap Japan guys because it was all the, the managers and team that yeah. built the car. And it was cool getting to like, first of all, the, the Japanese team loved seeing the car again because it was there for 20 yeah. plus years. And they were like, oh, this says, you know, to Jordan, the date of, you know, June of 2020. And I'm just like, ah. but yeah. I didn't even know it said that, yeah, you know, yeah, I just yeah, knew yeah. they had all signed it. And uh, when the car landed, there was a little Lotus bag that was in it. And it was a, it's a letter from the president of HKS, you know, telling me that it's upstairs and that this was his first project he managed and he would appreciate it if it was kept forever by me and which it will be. I love that it. That is amazing. Yeah. I, I, I really, really appreciate that. Thank, like, thank you for sharing <laughs> the story of this. It's a special car. It is. And, you know, I think it's clearly in the right hands. It was destined to be with you. It, well, I, I, I think that sometimes because, you know, who, who knows where it would have been or it could have traded hands and it's such a significant part of their company's history. And, you know, the fact that I have it, I feel good because it, it lives better than me. That's a, that's a fact, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, talking of living, you have a nice area to, to lounge around upstairs. Yeah, a little upstairs. Should we go have yeah, a quick, yeah, let's uh, take a look. quick nosy? Big part of any uh, perfect dream garage. Yeah, man. Is what you can do with the extra space you have. Check this out. What a space. Yeah. This is mega. Thanks, man. I, I absolutely love this. View over the cars. Yes. Your office space up here. Yeah. It was nice to, we bought this building right before COVID. Yeah. So, you know, I couldn't even imagine like how, I probably would have gone crazy in my house. So the timing <laughs> was like absolutely epic. I got to do a lot of the design up here. Shout out to my wife. She did a lot of the um, designs with the shelves and kind of organizing everything. Because yeah. if it was up to me, it would just be probably a crazy cluttered mess with all my stuff up kinda here. Kind of like how my place looks. <laughs> yeah, it just happens, man. When you get the room, you got to fill it. Stuff everywhere. But yeah. Cool memorabilia. Yeah. Hey, I know that Pagani shirt. I have yeah. That, I have that design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, BH had a charity auction. So I got to buy a knob, which is an HKS driver. I got an autograph suit from him. I got the Pagani shirt and then some Pagani uh, memorabilia that's in the bathroom. Uh, really cool, like dealer only photos yep. of a, yeah, of a Huayra. Really cool to be stuff. So very cool. Yep. Things like skate decks. Yeah. The, so my buddy built a bot. I'm just trying to be a supportive friend for like a, you know, drops. They do these bots that do the buys. Yeah. So I'm like, Hey man, I'd love to get a Lamborghini deck. He's like, I'm gonna test the bot. I'm like, awesome. So <laughs> he tests the bot. He's like, Hey man, it want, it worked. I'm like, heck yeah. And he's like, it bought four of them. So I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to pay you for four of them. Cause I thought we just only needed one, but it worked, so, it worked so well. So yeah, I got a couple of the Lambo decks and, um, OG motor X plate frame and the, yeah. the so it's like really kind of hard stuff to find and just some little bits of stuff that's important obviously some cool HKS swag the uh, 50th anniversary edition watch they did yeah. um, halo car on the wall the P1 I hope one day to get one that's yeah like that's my the dream ultimate dream car man cool yeah so let's get that battery fixed McLaren and let's get this yeah, going yeah. <laughs> get it up and running get it up and running 
But yeah. I love that you've got, you know, you've got your, your lounge area, your office area, you've got a sim. Yeah, I did the sim. It gets hot here in the summer. We yeah. like to track the cars, so it was cool to have something to keep the skill sharp. Um, I set this room up for uh, just some friends if they ever want to come up here. Yeah. This table kind of folds up and they can work from this little couch here. Good view to, to work it. out of. That, that This is what I love. I, I mean, I think uh, a lot of us creating our garages or dreaming of what the man cave could look like gravitate towards this because the view, the perspective you have of cars from above yes. is just such an unusual feeling of it. It, yeah. like, it adds a new dimension literally to the car. It's like a total, like kind of like a it's like fantasy factory to like look at everything. And like you said, when you're up here, you never really get to see everything from an aerial point of view. It and reminds just, you of being a kid pushing little toy cars around. It does. Like, just yeah. imagine you're moving them around. Yeah, and they're just stacked down there and I'm like, <laughs> I own these things, which is really cool, you know? Um, and this is like pretty cool. It's a sliding door, which, you know, I'll, I'll spare us opening because I'm sort of scared of heights, but um, you can actually, we loaded all the furniture on a flat, uh, forklift, yeah. brought it up here. Okay. And this whole mezzanine is actually load bearing. So there's a ton of motorcycles up here that the previous oh, owner okay. had. So if it was wide enough, in theory, a car could come up here, but yeah, yeah, yeah. he'll try to figure that out one day. Yeah, like a little, little mini or a yeah, yeah. Fiat 500 <laughs> yeah, or something. Yeah, 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 exactly. Get it yeah. <laughs> squeeze, squeeze it through. You got the pool table. You yeah, got I got the, the pool table. area. Mm -hmm. And this is a little Gallardo coffee table. Um, oh, okay. Yep. So, guy auto block. Yeah, I had a V10 twin turbo car we used to race. Yeah. And uh, a good friend of mine, he built the car, and we were really trying to gun for a world record with the manual. And uh, the motor was a little bit old, had a big turbo on it, and he, I was like, hey, man, let's just try to turn it up. He's like, I've never really turned it up like this, but I think we'll be okay. We were not okay. And the car <laughs> let go in fifth gear. Um, it was on a steamer of a pass, too, man. It probably would have got really close to the manual world record to be broken. But the the block shattered. It broke the whole cradle underneath. Yeah. Um, you can see the, uh, yeah. the hole right here. The okay. hole right here. Um, so, you know, you got to make... A, Make lemonade out of lemons, and that is yeah. now the most expensive coffee table I've ever purchased. Absolutely love it. <laughs> yeah. right? It's it's a memory, it's a story. It is, man, memory and a story. But this has just been a great spot. It's a it's a place for my friends to come. We hang out. We do F one days here. Yeah. So on Sundays cool. we uh, we watch Red Bull dominate, unfortunately. But um, it's just been a really really fun spot, man, to hang out and. Pool table, I'm not great at pool. <laughs> My wife and I tried to play a game of pool. I think it took us about two and a half hours. It was like <laughs> the world's longest like, soccer match. We well, were I can like, tell you what you don't want to do is launch a ball at the TV. No, and never. And I'm like so <laughs> worried that like one day like I'm gonna shatter glass. Yeah. I had no idea how much this, how much these big panes of glass cost <laughs> the glass companies around the corner. And when he was telling me how much each one was, I was like, all right, now we have to be very careful playing yeah. pool. Yeah, so yeah. Don't let me near it. Yeah, man. That would so. be dangerous. No, it's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love also like you've even got the Japanese magazines and things. Yeah, the GTR mags and like there's a uh, there's T002 yeah, that's yeah. down there wearing its old livery. I actually became so crazy with finding the old merch. I have two of these vintage 1995 HKS jackets. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, just small stuff like this, and it's just so it is just so freaking cool, man, to see it. This is in its old livery, like I yeah. said, but all the parts development and being such an important car, it's just, I don't know, so rad, man. I just love stuff like this. Yeah, and for sure. The preservation of print, too, versus all yeah. digital today. There's something there's something even more special. I Don't get me wrong. It's cool to find articles from online and stuff and social media, et cetera. But there's something, like, about the physical. Yeah. That's what was written about this car in the 90s. That's that. Like, yeah. It's, and it's here now. It's, yeah. like, downstairs. It's almost just, like... I feel really... I feel lucky and really fortunate, but, like, stuff like this is just... I don't know, it's like a pinch me moment sometimes yeah. that, you know, I don't know, it's just, it makes me feel so good that it's here and it's in the magazine yeah. and it was just such an iconic car to me. Well, can I just say thank you very much? Hey man, I, I really, I'm glad you came, man. Like, I really appreciate hearing your passion that's led to, to the cars, the collection, the stories, how much you enjoy them, how much you appreciate them. And being able to share that is really, really special. So thank I you appreciate very much. that. And you're a purist yourself, dude, so that's <laughs> rad. Well, we're here for the same reason. We yeah. love cars. It's been an amazing day. Thank you very much. No problem, man. Thanks. Back downstairs, and I've got to say, in fact, I always say when I visit car collections, they're always unique. They're about the passion of the person that's behind them. And you see that here with Jordan's cars, with the setup, with the theme. Of course, obviously the opposite of what I love, which is bright colors. But it's the fact that the continuation is there, whether it's 
a Viper ACR, whether it's an R34 GTR, or whether it's an E39 M5. It's that complete mix of different cars as well, but all cars that are enjoyed, cars that are driven, cars that, as we've heard from speaking with Jordan, he knows all about through and through, and cars that, in so many cases, have a personal story. And I find that so incredibly inspirational. It's aspirational as well to, to get that feeling, to be part of it all. So I'd like to say a huge thanks to him for the opportunity to come down today. Do go and follow Lowballer GTR if you don't already to see more of these cars and who knows what in the future. That's it for now though. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again next time. Cheers.